If you were a child between the ages of 8 and 13, right at the very end of the 2000s, then you might experience near euphoric levels of nostalgia for Kaponk. In 2009, Hasbro released one of their riskiest product lines in the company's history, when designers managed to package and sell a ball and a cup. But in many ways it was more than that. Hasbro was attempting to sell an attitude, an idea, one that they hoped would cultivate an entire lifestyle brand, nestled somewhere in between 2000s skate culture and dude-perfect style trick shots. But just as Kaponk was finding its footing in the market, the product vanished, leaving us with a shelf-life legacy that barely lasted over a year. So today, we're going to be diving deeper than we ever have before on this channel, conducting interviews, uncovering lost media, and learning exactly how this simple yet captivating little game came to be. You see, as we'll come to learn, Kaponk was actually quite an ambitious idea, and at the time, some might have called it a long shot. But in a perfect way, that's kind of what this story is all about. This is how Kaponk sold beer pong to kids. Yeah, I'm not trying that again. Let's start at the beginning. It's the mid-2000s, and Hasbro's game department is in a bit of a conundrum. Like many long-lived toy and game companies, there comes a time when their presence in the market eventually hits a growth ceiling. You see, Hasbro had dozens of hit games on the market, including Monopoly, Connect 4, Battleship, Yahtzee, I mean, the list really does go on. In marketing, these iconic titles are commonly referred to as evergreen products. They never lose demand, sell well throughout the entire year, and in the case of board games, they no longer really even need commercials. They're undeniably timeless, and while that's great for persistent revenue, it's not very productive for growth. When it comes to increasing profits, new products need to be introduced, and most importantly, perform well. And this wasn't really happening for Hasbro. They would launch about 20 to 30 new products every year, and almost all of them would not live to see a second year. And it was just part of the cycle of, we need new things, we're going to keep trying. <laughs> the company was kind of playing it safe opting to focus on new and improved takes for pre-existing properties. But this wasn't exactly a winning strategy. Enter Dan Sanfilippo, a designer who worked at Hasbro during the mid-2000s who was kind enough to speak to me about his time there. So my first internship when I was a sophomore in college was working on Star Wars Episode One toys. And I was like coloring basically. So I'd go into work and they say, here are these line drawings, pick the color. So I would like color them all with markers. And then when I got my full-time job, it was at the games division. One of my first projects was uh, bringing back the game of Bop It. Twist it. The demanding, commanding challenge Pull of Bop It has found a brand new edge. Bop It. Bop It Extreme 2. I started to do more projects like that or like games like Operation that kind of needed to be refreshed. Fresh, I changed a lot of that. So I was working on a lot of things that had come and did well, but then kind of faded away and trying to reinvent them for a new generation. But Hasbro's problems persisted. It was roughly 2007 at this point, and the company still hadn't found their next big breakthrough game. Until now, they had kind of just been throwing a hundred darts at a wall and seeing what stuck, which obviously wasn't financially sustainable. In order to try and remedy this, Hasbro would devise a drastic new approach to their product development strategies. They gave the team members like real autonomy to figure out what to do because nobody could solve the problem of launching a new game that was a success. This would incorporate the use of blitz groups or small teams of three that were made up of one designer, one marketer, and a consumer insights specialist. These micro teams would be assigned a demographic, like girls under 10 or preteen boys, and would then collaborate to develop a game concept for that slice of the market. And they let us go off and do a bunch of research and come back to them with what we thought was the right thing to do. And it was that's a rare thing in a big company, where it was sort of a bottom-up approach to get to the ideas. The ultimate goal was for each group to devise a product pitch that would then be presented to the higher-ups at Hasbro. 
In 2007, Dan was chosen to participate in one of these Blitz groups, where he was assigned the demographic for preteen boys. And this was kind of an exciting group. And I think the biggest insight we had on the boys team was that we don't have a game for boys. There were some games that did well for girls. There was Mall Madness and Dream Phone. And most of the stuff was targeted at preschool kids. And a lot of it was family. Battleship and Risk were the only things that came close. And Risk being kind of a little older, like you kind of need to be a teenager to, to get into that. And then Battleship, we realized, was being bought by moms in the hopes that dads would play it with their sons. <laughs> like there was no boy we ever talked to that couldn't wait to get Battleship. So we had this great like vacuum of like no boy wanted anything our company made. And so the research began. Dan's team was looking to find out what it was that preteen boys were actually into in 2007. This would lead their team to speak with coaches, parents, and teachers to try and get a better understanding of this demographic. And yes, they spoke to young boys too. But oftentimes it was the adults that gave better insight into what children were actually into. Sure, an eight-year-old boy could tell you that he liked super soakers, but a parent or guardian could tell you why. They might say things like, oh, he likes getting messy, or he likes having wars with his friends. This helped to identify opportunity areas in their research. Eventually, Dan and his team would pinpoint three distinct behavioral patterns that preteen boys engaged in. 1. They liked gross-out toys, things that got messy. 2. They enjoyed violence and roughhousing. 3. They liked engaging in activities that made them feel more mature than they actually were. When you're between the ages of 8 and 12, you kind of want to be seen of as like tougher, older, more mature than you actually are. And anything that's associated with childhood or is too cute or too kid-like just feels like not cool at that point. This third point inevitably became the behavioral pattern that Dan's team chose to focus on. Sure, options one and two had their merits, but they had pretty valid reasons to avoid them. While it's true that boys do love violence and roughhousing, Hasbro kind of had all the violent implications they needed with their brand Nerf. On top of that, many kids had the option to play violent video games, and that was the last thing Hasbro wanted to compete with. In regards to their gross-out option, the truth was they kind of just had trouble finding an angle. It was challenging. We had like hundreds of concepts. There was something called mud ball we were looking at, but we had some drawings of kids basically like throwing a squishy sponge at each other that had like a dye in it or something. There was like fart racers, which was a, a racing game with cars and they would use like air power and they would actually make fart noises. That one ended up being a little younger, but. So Dan and his team began work on their third lead, the one later dubbed as the Be The Man Approach, which focused on preteen boys and their infatuation with activities that older teens and adults would engage in. Ultimately, the goal was to build a game concept off of one of these grown-up activities. The team bounced around a lot between gambling and bar games, but the game idea they kept coming back to was one they themselves all played in college. When we kept coming back to beer pong, because they could do it, number one, and number two, it's its association with college parties instantly gave it a coolness factor. Now, right off the cuff, the game doesn't sound like the most morally sound concept to be marketing towards children. But Dan realized that as soon as the adult elements of drinking were stripped away, you were actually left with a pretty addicting game of skill. And this was coincidentally one of the concepts that young boys were most attracted to. It was the idea of skill, mastery, and being able to show off that made beer pong so enticing, or darts or skateboarding for that matter. It was a way to one-up your buddies, look cool, and be the man. What made this idea even more convincing was that they kind of already had a proof of concept. We had a game called Bullseye Ball, which kind of looked like Ski Ball. <gasps> Released in 2003, Bullseye Ball would have players bouncing small metal marbles off a trampoline in order to score points. It was actually one of Hasbro's new ideas that managed to perform fairly well, and the game is still in print today. But in 2007, Bullseye Ball was a great framework for the kind of idea Dan and his team wanted to achieve just with many, many modifications. You see, Bullseye Ball was addicting, and it was beer pong-esque. 
but it didn't place the same amount of emphasis on skill. It was very neutral. It had no edge to it. It wasn't like yeah. an interesting, cool thing. Uh, but it was just really, we knew it was addictive and we knew kids once they started to play it, really liked to play it. With this knowledge in mind, the team would eventually produce their first ever prototype called Kapong. This concept made use of three cups and a ping pong ball. Each cup was stacked at a different level and each rewarded the player with a different number of points by lighting up and making sounds. Players would then take turns making shots at the cups, and the player with the most points after a predetermined number of rounds was the winner. They also hoped that an edgier approach to packaging design would be a selling point for the game. Now, this concept was not the one that eventually made it to market, but it was the one they would pitch to the CEO of Hasbro. My boss, Alan Roach, and uh, the marketing partner made a presentation to the CEO of the company, Brian Goldner. And it was like this controversial thing, like we're gonna try and sell this in, but they're never gonna go for it <laughs> because everybody's gonna laugh that it's kind of like beer pong. But we yeah. took them through that story of you know, like, we talked to this many kids, we found these opportunity areas, we tested these concepts. The winning concept is this, and it's bounce a ball into a cup. And then like, they're like, yeah, this makes sense. Let's go for it. Although the idea was simple, Hasbro understood their research and appreciated the approach, ultimately sending the product into the next stage of development. So I remember him, Alan, coming out of the, the presentation be like, we just sold it beer pong. Now, with the project greenlighted, Hasbro would begin to invest resources into the idea, which meant Dan and his little Blitz team would grow exponentially. At this point, a roadmap was being laid out, a budget had been drawn, and Dan and his team felt like they had a pretty clear vision of their new product. But as development began, this vision would start to blur. When you sell something in like that, everyone agrees to the concept, but then there's a there's a period of refinement, right? Where you go from that raw idea to what are we actually gonna make and how much is it gonna cost? The first problem the team encountered was their cost of production. Turns out packaging three cups that required sensors, lights, and sounds was kind of an expensive route to take, especially considering their goals. Early on, the team speculated on how they could, quote, sell 15 cents worth of components for $15, which I'm sure was a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. They didn't want the product to be too expensive. It's common for toy companies to try and sell products that kids can buy with an allowance, and that was clearly the goal here as well. Another issue was that the game was a little too restrictive with how much players could actually show off. There just wasn't much variety. You couldn't really one-up your buddy by doing anything remarkable, you could only score more points. These factors had become a legitimate problem, with the potential to send their entire team back to the drawing board. In order to remedy this issue, they'd have to rework the concept to be simpler, cheaper, yet still more effective. It wasn't going to be easy. But then, Dan got an email that would change the entire course of the product's development. The VP of design, Alan Gong, had a teenage son and he was like, my son can't stop watching this video. And he sent it to everybody on the team and immediately we were like, oh, this is it. titled Billy Balls 2. Starring in the video was professional skateboarder Billy Marks, engaging in one of his favorite pastimes, throwing a ping pong ball into a solo cup in as many creative ways as possible. At first glance, this video could be easily dismissed as some college-aged kid with too much time on his hands. But in reality, Billy Marks had unintentionally immortalized himself as one of the founding fathers of trickshotting a genre of content creation that would skyrocket in popularity throughout the following decade. Trickshot videos centered around a person accomplishing some sort of impressive feat of hand-eye coordination, usually through the use of a common item like a frisbee, paper airplane, or in Billy's case, a ping pong ball. The trend of trickshot challenges would see a meteoric rise throughout the tens, with creators like Dude Perfect and That's Amazing amassing monolithic online followings. It was a rapidly growing trend, and Billy's video made him a pioneer. 
During a time when the project's direction had begun to lose track, Billy Marks had breathed new life into their idea. All the elements the team were looking for were right there. The ability to show off, the prestige of mastery, the cool ties to skater culture. It was perfect. The Billy Balls video was a big game changer. It clicked that the trick shot element is going to give kids that inspiration. So it was like, I want to be able to master something and, sh and show off to everyone how good I am at it. So the Hasbro team circled back to the design phase, replacing their original three cup idea with just one single cup. The rules of the game were also changed. Now children would have to draw cards to determine what trick shot they would have to land. Or they could scrap the cards altogether and make up their own moves. And it was an immediate hit with test groups. Like we would watch kids do it. If you spent like a whole afternoon and you'd made like 30 misses and then one of them went in, the room would explode. Dan and his team quickly learned that boys are very okay with the idea of constantly failing as long as the possibility of enormous success is at the end. Boys understood that it probably took Billy a hundred tries to nail the chair bouncing shot, and they were okay with that. In fact, it was part of the appeal. These themes of repetition, improvement, and eventual mastery are the foundations for building skill, especially in skateboarding, which probably explains why Billy was so fond of his little game. Both activities draw multiple parallels between each other, and this was one of the reasons the idea looked so promising to Dan and his team. After a successful round of focus testing, designers and engineers would work together to develop a working prototype for the Kapong Cup, one that was much fancier than this. The final prototype was a battery-operated cup that lit up and made sounds when a ball would land inside. The game would also come equipped with a deck of trick cards, two ping-pong balls, and a cardboard funnel to help beginners. Now all they had to do was make it cool. Remember, the team was still very much set on the idea of marketing an alternative and edgy toy for boys that gave the impression they were engaging in a big kid activity, and they needed a brand image to reflect this. Enter Drew Doherty, a designer, illustrator, and owner of Branding by Context, a creative agency that helps develop brands. He's the one that brought so much energy and so much of the skateboard-esque um, feel to it. And it was through Drew's persistence that he would eventually end up partnering with Hasbro. Well, I actually cold called them, picked up the phone, called up the creative director at Hasbro and asked him if I could send my portfolio. Because of my action sports background, they kind of saw the potential with Kaponk. Drew already had a few Hasbro products under his belt at this point and was brought on board to help breathe life into Kapong through logo and packaging design which, in hindsight, was one of the biggest contributors toward the toy's success. But getting to that stage was kind of a slow process. It's funny, it started out actually as a, like, a logo project, to like, come up with a logo, but they said, but well, we don't have the name. At the time, Hasbro was still developing the project under the working title of Kapong. But after consulting with their legal team, Hasbro's lawyers strongly advised them to take any reference of the word Pong out of the name. If this was going to work, there had to be virtually zero reference to the actual drinking game that the toy was based off of. So until that decision was finalized, Drew would doodle out dozens of logos under the name Cup Pong, Kapong, and so on. These initial concepts would help set the tone for the project, with designs that screamed bold and alternative, feeling more akin to a skateboard company than an actual children's toy. Anything you could think of, it was one of those opportunities. Any fun idea you could think of, you couldn't go wrong, which was really very energetic when you're a designer and a client says, well, what do you want to do? He's the first external contract person I had ever witnessed just providing so much extra content just because of the fun of the project. It wasn't just, we need 12 logos by Thursday. It was, look at all this stuff I made. Like, this is really cool. What if we did this and what if we did that? Eventually, Dan and his team would settle on a logo renaming the game to the edgy yet less implicit Kaponk. Kaponk to, to us sounded like what the ball sounds like when it bounces off the table. If we didn't have the limitation from legal, we would have called it Pong. And because yeah. we had that limitation, we had to be more creative and we ended up with something better. Drew would then work with Hasbro to develop the art used on the cups. And this was what really ended up setting the toy apart on shelves. 
The idea was to have unique variations for each set, with different artwork and colors, which let kids pick a favorite and, at the same time, promoted collectability. The first line consisted of the versions Let It Rip, Gorillanator, and El Campeón. These cups were brightly colored and a feast for the eyes, with tons of detail for your hyperactive nine-year-old brain to absorb. On Let It Rip, you'll find a group of zombies playing their own whacked-out version of Kapok, bouncing eyeballs off brains and bones while a horde of other zombies look on from the background. On Gorillanator, you have a squad of ape commandos drawn in the style of Jamie Hewlett, and on El Campeón, a team of luchadors flexes their muscles while the one on the front sports a hot pink Kaponk tattoo. To add to their charm, Drew would work with Hasbro to design an equally appealing packaging, with attitude scribbled into every detail. The final product was printed on simple, unpainted cardboard that placed the cup and its artwork front and center. Each side of the box displayed the name of the game, along with a quippy explanation of how to play on the back of the box. From a design standpoint, you can barely take your eyes off the thing. There's so many little stickers, quips, and details that I'm still just noticing some for the first time over a decade later. They even found a way to creatively display the ping pong balls. On the top of the box, you'll find it encased in plastic. And on the bottom, you'll find a hole so the boxes can still be stacked on store shelves. And they even used that hole to put more quippy one-liners, like what came first, the ball or the cup? Or if you're reading this, just buy it already. From the countless logo designs to the art and packaging, it is undeniable that Drew and his team poured passion into every aspect of Kaponk's branding. And it was their combined efforts that helped make the product so appealing on shelves. For a project like this, there was no reason to not want to go above and beyond. Now, with the product developed and the packaging complete, Hasbro was gearing up to make their commercial debut. To help build up their brand image, Hasbro would acquire endorsements from skateboarders, BMXers, and professional cool guys who would make home videos of themselves playing Kaponk, including Billy Balls himself. Hi, I'm Billy Marks. This is Kaponk. But these online brand promotions weren't the only part of Hasbro's marketing campaign. Say hello to Stephen Block and Michael Anderson, two of the creators who worked directly on the televised advertisements for Kaponk. I remember this thing came across our desk and we're like, shit, this is actually very cool. Michael and Stephen had quite a realized vision for the commercials, taking care to keep that raw and uncut feel that made trick shot videos so popular. You know, the graphics really took us to a skate world and how they shoot skate videos. And, you know, skateboard videos are shot by skaters and they're shot on the fly. You know, they're not even permitted. And we're like, shit, let's do that. It was a unique approach, but the idea became all the more exciting when they learned who'd be starring on set. We just, we want to get like a celebrity director. We had this great production company that we did a lot yeah. of work with at that point in time. And the guy who ran that, he's like, I reached out and I have somebody for you guys that can be your PR celebrity director. And the client's sitting there listening and he goes, Bam Margera. And the guy's face, the smile just went like the Joker. He was just like, <laughs> oh. Bam Margera was a huge addition to the Kaponk brand. And even though he kind of got the name of the game wrong, I'm Bam Margera on location shooting Kaponk. He was still reportedly enthusiastic and quite pleasant to work with, even while still remaining his authentic self. When he gets into the job, he is 100% professional in there. Like, there's two different BAMs on set. There's like work <laughs> BAM and regular BAM. I'm gonna come up there and one's gonna be here. Yeah. You try to just throw it. And regular BAM's the guy who gets to the shoot and goes, guys, I lost my phone. I don't know what my phone is. Um, and it's either in the guitar player from Nine Inch Nails Hotel Room or Lindsay Lohan's car. That's what he says to us. Two Derek Punk Rocks from BAM. It's cool little <laughs> stuff. And I have like a skateboard too that he signed. But when he's talking to camera and he's saying, I'm BAM Margera, the line was, I'm Bam Margera, I'm in Pasadena, and blah, 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 this is Kapong. And the first time we read it, he goes, I'm Bam Margera, and I'm... Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> in regards to the commercials, many of the scenes Michael and Steven would shoot were meant to look casual, as though a bunch of college kids were just hanging around making trick shots, with one player going as far as to pretend to reach in the fridge for a soda after landing a shot. 
It was obviously staged, but that didn't matter. The approach Michael and Stephen took did a fantastic job of making Kaponk look authentic and trendy, and their casting decisions helped create that impression. Even the talent that you pick for commercials, like everyone's always older than they should be for the product because every kid aspires up. So for us, that's why we had older talent, teenagers, and there was, I'm sure there were people in their 20s on the shoot. Even though it was technically for kids, I don't think there was a single kid in any of the casting. So with the commercials cleared to air and the toys set to ship, Hasbro was ready to bring Kaponk to the world. In North America, TV promotion began with an infomercial, which wasn't quite the punk rock entrance I think audiences were expecting, but they fixed that. Sometime later, 15 second spots would begin to air on children's channels, and it was virtually an instant hit. And they were selling a lot of these toys. This thing exploded within like the first four months in market. Everything from the attitude to the packaging to the concept itself was so cool and captivating. The commercials gave you the feeling that you were getting a peek into this alternative, on-the-fringe subculture that was just starting to emerge. Hasbro also did a clever job of keeping their name out of it. The commercial never even mentions the company apart from a small watermark, and the packaging only has a tiny Hasbro logo on the bottom of the box. Because, as we all know, corporate just ain't cool, man. Super unusual to break the branding code. I mean, I'm glad they did it. They kind of needed to do it, but I'm sure it was like a pain point for somebody. Kaponk crushed its opening year, selling over 2 million units in 2009 and igniting an online YouTube craze that allowed the toy to, at least for a time, sell itself. To this day, you can still find hundreds of uploads from when this toy was popular with kids compiling all their sickest Kaponk trick shots into YouTube montages. I mean, here's mine that I did with my brother in 2010, but never uploaded. That was just total onage. It was quite the phenomenon, and its reception even surprised Hasbro. It did so well, we were having a meeting with one of the marketing guys, and he goes, Kaponk is selling four times, five times what we ever thought it would. Sales were exploding, even before the holiday season, and that gave the company the encouragement they needed to keep going. 2010 would see the release of three new Kaponk Cups, those being Boom Shakalaka, Monstrosity, and The King of L.A. These new designs continued to rely on bright, detailed art and eye-catching characters. That same year, Hasbro would also release a special edition called Le Flush Royale, which included stickers, a headband, additional trick cards, and the coveted Golden Kaponk Cup, which I regrettably do not own. But the hype train wouldn't end there. Kaponk's popularity would manage to boil over into 2011, with the limited edition Transformers Kaponk Cups printed exclusively for Comic-Con. Drew shared some of the concept art for these cups with me, and while the collaboration kind of leaves you wondering who this was meant for, it's still quite a neat relic. But he managed to show me something else as well. Something I unknowingly had been waiting over 13 years to see. During our conversation, Drew revealed to me the never-before-seen, unreleased third wave of Kaponk. Hey, these were 100% complete. These were ready to go to market. Now, I've been researching toys and media on this channel for a little over a year now. But this discovery was hands down the coolest one yet. This third wave of cups was so, so close to being released, but as you'll soon learn, these designs never got to see the light of store shelves, or the internet for that matter, until now. This third wave included the cups Mr. Curse's Circus, Of Mucus and Men, and Sayonara Inc. All phenomenal pieces of work that acted as a testament to the product's original momentum. In 2011, with the constant release of new additions and the popularity of the toy still persisting, Dan Sanfilippo was eventually promoted to manage the entirety of the Kaponk brand. And he had some pretty big plans to help take the product to the next level. Very early on, Dan saw the opportunity for Kaponk, not only as an addictive ball and cup game, but as an entire, all-encompassing trickshot brand. 
This inspired Dan to consolidate his team's ideas into a pitch deck, consisting of all the possible concepts that could be developed to expand Kaponk's product line. 100% was like, we can take this beyond ping pong balls and yeah. make it about creativity and trick shots and capturing that on video. And we were yeah. trying to figure out every way we could do it. We had this giant one, which was like a soccer ball you kicked into like a basket that closed automatically when you got it in there. We had one that was like dice, that was like a really small concept. And we had like a freestyle idea, which was more almost like use any object around your house and do something cool with it. So it was just a card deck. The team would then take these ideas and present them to Hasbro with the hope that they could begin scaling the brand. And this was quite a big step. You see, Hasbro is a very large company that owns the rights to some very large properties. You've got sub-brands like Nerf, Play-Doh, Transformers. My point is, Dan and his team were looking to have Kaponk make that list. They were dreaming of not only a trick shot toy line, but an entire lifestyle brand centered around the online culture of skill-based hand-eye coordination challenges. But Hasbro had other ideas. After Dan presented his pitch, the big dogs would fire back with a proposal of their own suggesting that Kaponk be made a sub-brand of Nerf. This certainly changed things. You see, Nerf is a massive, massive property for Hasbro. Their toys sell wildly, there's a rabid online fan base, and the brand has since partnered with multiple million dollar franchises. And one of the ways Nerf could get bigger was by putting smaller Hasbro properties under its name. Think Kaponk from Nerf. Since Nerf was already an action sport brand, Hasbro didn't see it as too much of a stretch to put skill-based games under that umbrella. It was, it was almost like a visual thing. When we took the Kaponk style and took the logo off of it, or said like Kaponk from the makers of Nerf, there was all these ways we were kind of looking to bring it under the Nerf umbrella. People just kind of like didn't get it anymore. Placing Kaponk under the Nerf brand felt like losing the plot in terms of what made Kaponk Kaponk. And while it may have seemed like a smart business decision, from a consumer perspective, it just looked kind of confusing. I think that's where companies always fall down, is they take what might be a, a good business decision and they try and force that on the actual consumers who don't get it. And like, I think to a kid who already bought into Kaponk and wants more, they would be like, well, why is it Nerf now? You, we didn't have an answer for that. You could argue that the merger would have helped develop brand trust, since Kaponk was a new, expanding brand, and slapping Nerf on the box would give it that extra bit of clout to really sell toys. That's one thing Hasbro has done, generally done well, is good or bad, like they put a lot of stuff into branded buckets. Might not be the most fun thing from an independent creative person thinking about a product, but it does sell well to a parent's like, oh, my son likes Nerf, I'll get him this Nerf Kaponk thing. You see, by 2011, Kaponk wasn't really selling itself the way Nerf was. As it was started to stop being successful, they would have to pump a bunch of money into advertising it. So when they take the ads off the air, sales would go down pretty dramatically. When they put the ads back on the air, sales would go back up. So there's a lot of other products in Hasbro's portfolio that don't require that type of heavy push because they're well-known brands that have been around for a long time, aka Nerf. Speculation can also point toward the idea that this proposal was somewhat political. It's very possible that executives who were in charge of Nerf knew that acquiring other properties would make their brand look bigger, which could accelerate careers, inspire pay bonuses, and just flat out make them look better. But regardless, whatever reason Hasbro came up with to try and rationalize the merger simply wasn't working. The story was lost, and with resistance from both sides regarding where to take the brand, Kaponk eventually fell through the cracks. It really is that anticlimactic. I've interviewed five different people who worked on the brand, and I still haven't received a straight answer as to what actually took Kaponk off shelves. We had all these ideas for a lifestyle brand and how to, you know, this and that and this and that. And then out of nowhere, they're like, yeah, that whole thing's discontinued. We're no longer doing Kaponk. One theory is that the pink version of the toy was the actual stick in the spokes. During the first wave of Kaponk, marketers quickly realized that for boys in 2009, pink was kind of cool, and this trend convinced the company to release a pink colorway for their first wave of toys. 
pink was a very popular color at the time for skaters. And we made the case, we did all this research because there was some concern, like you can't make a pink boys toy. Right. And that was, it was like, no, these are kind of alternative kids and pink is cool for them. And so we committed to that. But the issue was if grandma asks, what does grandson want for Christmas? And they say, oh, he's been watching this Capon commercials and says he wants one of those. And then they go to Walmart. Grandma's not going to buy the pink one. Mom might not buy that one. So even if there are boys that would want that, it just wasn't moving. And we had some issues with like the rest of them were sold out, but they wouldn't order new ones until the pink one sold through. Involved as the project was, it's pretty silly that it might've come down to literally just the color on the box. I don't remember exactly what happened. They kind of didn't know where Kaponk was going after that. And someplace it just fell through the cracks. Even as insiders, we knew the client, we knew the next strategy for the following year. We're exposed yeah. to all that sort of stuff. And it just went away and no one could tell us why. Now, here's my take on the whole thing. And this is the honest truth. As a 12-year-old boy in 2010, the idea of Kaponk completely gripped me. Everything from the marketing, to the packaging, to the emphasis on skill totally sold me on the product. I had to have one. But when I finally did, I got bored pretty quickly. I don't recall playing with it for longer than a month, and I don't remember ever feeling like I needed to collect more than one. Which kind of proves Dan's original theory correct. For Kaponk to have continued, the product line would have needed to expand, with new and exciting ideas for skill-based games. And had Hasbro been able to agree on a direction back in 2011, it's possible that the brand could have seen further success. Regardless of the actual reason for Kaponk's decline, the toy was abruptly discontinued in 2011. And even with the growing popularity of the skill shot trend, the idea would never really take off at Hasbro in the same way again. Sure, Nerf would do a collaboration with Trickshot Legends Dude Perfect in the mid-10s, but this was a brief partnership, paling in comparison to the roadmap originally proposed for Kaponk. Coincidentally, Nerf is currently marketing itself through Happy Meals, consisting of toys that all seem to be part of some sort of hand-eye coordination challenge. And while it's highly unlikely that this is alluding to an entire Kaponk revival, it seems like the idea of the toy hasn't been completely dismissed, even after all these years. But even with Kaponk long gone, you have got to applaud what Dan and his team managed to accomplish. In 2009, social media and devices were just gearing up to take over our lives. And this game was being marketed right at the cusp of that new era. Sure, some critics might have passed the toy off as just a ball in a cup, but at least it was a genuine experience that allowed kids to be creative, get off their couch, and try to get better at something. Not to mention, considering the target demographic, this was the last toy a lot of boys would ever buy before they made the leap to adolescence, and that was certainly the case for me. Now, this entire time, some of you might have been asking, where was this toy? I've never heard of it. How could this have been so popular if I never even saw it on shelves? Well, you're totally justified in your reasoning. Kaponk was incredibly short-lived, and it fizzled out in popularity just about as fast as it blew up. It was pretty easy to miss, and today it's criminally overlooked in toy history. But I think that's what makes this story so interesting. Just because it was short-lived doesn't mean it was any less loved especially by those who actually worked on it. While compiling my research for this project, it was pretty difficult to pin down some of the people responsible for Kaponk. But when I did, they were all so happy to hear that there was someone out there who still remembered this toy that they all worked so passionately on, even if only for a brief time. Many even went on to call it a career highlight. From what I came to understand, it wasn't every day that the people at Hasbro got to work on an entirely original project with this much creative liberty. And for it to be successful on top of that, it's no wonder everyone I spoke to was so proud to have worked on this. So yes, Kaponk was weird, often overlooked, and virtually forgotten. But it opened my eyes to something. Sure, at the end of the day, these massive corporations like Hasbro are looking to make money. But behind those balance sheets, behind those shareholder letters and income statements, 
there's a group of passionate individuals striving to make something truly fun for children. So, I know it's about 13 years late, but thank you Dan, Derek, Drew, Michael, Stephen, Alan, and every other person who put passion behind this product. I hope this video brings to light the amazing work you all did and revives a newfound appreciation for this long-forgotten little toy. Kaponk may be gone, but it still lives on in our memories, our hearts, and this 25-year-old man-child who stubbornly refuses to let go of the past. Yes! Thanks for watching. And a big thanks to our Patreon producers. Zeta Slow. Xander Kyle. And the number one Discord admin in all of Scotland. Dean.